So thanks for coming. This is our fifth Tuesday talk of the summer, five out of eight. Tonight, I'm really excited to have Dr. Dave Bethany here from the Commercial Fisheries Research Foundation, CFRF. And I should tell you before I launch into that whole diatribe about BIMI, if you're not so familiar, but our mission is to inspire appreciation of the incredible saltwater environment around Block Island. And to do this through our educational programs and our hands-on exploration. If you support this mission or these ideas, please consider donating online or donating here tonight. That's how we support what we're doing here. So anyway, Dave has been the executive director of the CFRF for, I think, three years now. I first became aware of that organization four years ago at the Maine Fishermen's Forum. When I heard them talk uh, about fish populations and studies that they were doing, and I thought it was a tremendous, first of all, it was the best presentation at the event. They had the best research, the best data, and that's because the commercial fishermen are gathering this data and reporting it on a volunteer basis. And so it's the best data we're getting, uh, or some of the best data for sure, for the New England coast. And what really impressed me as well is not only was that nonprofit located in Southern Rhode Island, but they had a panel of fishermen from Point Judith up there in the Maine Fisherman's Forum in Rockland, Maine, talking to Maine fishermen about what's going on and how to do the research. And at that point, I was just starting to get involved in BIMI. I said, we've got to get someone from the CFRF here to talk about what they're doing so you all can learn about it too. So Dave, welcome. Uh, thanks so much for the introduction. Thanks for BIMI for having me and thanks for all of you for coming to hear me talk about the research foundation and the work that we're doing uh, with the local fishermen here. So, that just want to give a brief overview of the talk before I dive in. Just want to start by giving a background of the foundation because I'm sure many of you are not familiar with us and our mission and where we come from. And then we'll kind of get into you know what what we're doing with the fishermen. There's really four main work areas that you see bulleted here, um, and I will give examples from projects of how we're trying to work in those areas. And I won't talk about all of our projects, but I'll try to give examples that I thought from talking to George were, were pretty relevant to Block Island. Um, hopefully that's of interest to you all. So with that, who we are, we are located right across the water from you all in Southern Rhode Island here. We're actually on the University of Rhode Island campus, uh, their East Farm campus, anyone familiar with the Kingston campus. And we are our own nonprofit. Uh, independent of University of Rhode Island, but they are really huge supporters of us. They give us this building on the campus. They take care of all the maintenance, utility costs. We don't have a lease. These are huge benefits for a nonprofit. You don't have to worry about. So, you know, it's a collaboration. And you'll see through these projects that we work with them too, from the science perspective as well. So, what are we doing from this little building on URI campus? Uh, here's our mission. But it's really trying to do work in those four areas, trying to fill data gaps, trying to create opportunities, trying to communicate science, and trying to educate uh, young people through internships or through lectures so that they can learn from the beginning that fishermen and scientists can work together to solve problems. It's so often, you know, one side of the aisle and the other is how it's depicted, but it doesn't have to be that way. So just a brief history is we're about 20 years old, um, but we changed from where we started to what we are today. So there was a disaster relief funds given to fishermen in 2004 from the collapse of cod and had its stocks in New England. And the fishermen that founded this foundation, instead of inv investing that back into their businesses, they wanted to make a new organization that could do complementary, or what they say is um, you know, a second avenue of science to help prevent that collapse from happening again. So that's how it started. It quickly expanded to not just cod and haddock and, and species that we call ground fish, flat fish, all other sorts of fish as well. And for the first you know, decade, it was called the Southern New England 
uh, Collaborative Research Institute. What they were getting was after they invested that initial money, they got earmarked from the federal government to fund research. People would apply to CFRF to do research, you know, scientists and fishermen together. CFRF would then fund those projects they deem uh, most worthy. Then in 2013, and that was under the leadership of Ted Carter. And then in 2013, there was a fundamental switch when the earmarks were taken away. And now we were a competitive um, nonprofit trying to apply for grants, just like Bindi trying to seek donations to keep this research going. Um, and that was under the leadership of Anna Mercer before me, who now leads the cooperative research from the federal government perspective. Um, so you can see how this switch really could cause a difference in how your institution is run. And that's the, the realm that I'm in right now. So our current leadership, all of our board is people that are in the commercial fishing community. They're either commercial fishermen themselves or they work on the shore side to support, you know, processors, um, net manufacturers, things of that sort. So you may know some of these faces are all local. And then I also want to recognize the staff that is the engine that keeps the foundation running. Without these people, none of the research that you're going to hear about today would be possible. And the same goes for the fishermen that we work with. Um, so I just put kind of, you know, what they work on. They, they work on other things too, but these are kind of their main areas of focus. Um, and then I also want to just recognize all the different fishing vessels names here, but it's the crews and captains and owners of these vessels that are participating with that staff uh, and all the other supporters as well to achieve these research goals. And I uh, bolded two vessels, Block, Block Island, the Deborah H and the Linda and Laura, and I'll talk about the specific project that those two vessels are working with us on, the lobster crab research group uh, in detail. So we're working with a lot of different fishermen from New Jersey up to Maine, a lot of Rhode Island though. And we have tons of collaborators from outside the organization that we work with. So it's, it's not just us and the fishermen, we work with a lot of different partners from other NGOs and the federal government and the state government as well. And that really, you'll see where these people come in. These are collaborators either giving us guidance or are co-investigators for these projects that we're executing. So with that, what are we doing? First mission is to fill data gaps. So this is points where we see that there's something missing from the research that needs to be done to make a fishery sustainable. And we wanna step in and help fishermen contribute to that. So the first thing we do is we call them research fleets and we're giving the fishermen the tools to collect scientific data. And we didn't, started with this in mind, but in kind of researching, you know, what we're doing, it's, it's this thing called the collective impact approach. And it's not something that we made up. Um, this thing I stole here is from the United Way, very big nonprofit, but it's basically showing an approach where you work together with people outside your organization to make the impact, you know, greater and sustained. So I kind of put the people that contribute to our collective impact here, and then I will go through the lobster crab research fleet and hit on how I think these five points are expressed in that fleet design and the research fishermen are doing. So I've mentioned this, the lobster crab research fleet, what is the agenda? What is the common gap? What is the agreed upon solution? So if we zoom back to about 10 years ago, 2011, 2013, um, this picture here, you're seeing anything that's a blob is fishing effort for pots and traps. So this is mostly lobster, it's the best I can do to get lobster fishing effort uh, in federal waters shown to you. So the point is that there's a lot of fishing activity in federal waters for lobsters and crabs, but all of the data or most of the data is coming from state water uh, assessment. So there's this gap where there's very little scientific information coming from where you're seeing these blobs. And most of it is from inshore areas of that. So the collective impact or how we agreed was that the fishery should be empowered to fill this gap. Um, here's just an example from a stock assessment is that what they do to assess 
shouldn't use the same word as the definition, but the stock assessment is how we determine the levels and the population stats, level of harvest and population stats. So basically a priority was to get information from offshore waters back in 2015. And we worked with a group of scientists and fishermen. So this is an actual picture from the very first meeting um, that we were gonna empower the fishermen to fill this gap. The agreed upon tools and metrics, it was this, key part is this thing called on deck data so it was an app there was one i gave on the front there if you want to play around with this you can pass it around um, this is something that the fishermen use when they're out at sea that can help them direct sampling so if they follow this app they follow our instructions they can collect data in a scientific manner that could be used to fill those gaps and i should mention too that a person named don cox who I left this boat right outside here in Block Island is a person that made this app for us. So another connection um, to Block Island is a person that makes this on deck data app. So we were gonna give fishermen an app. We were gonna give them tools to measure the animals, probes to measure temperature. Um, we were gonna give them compensation to us for asking them to do a job on top of their other job. So be a scientist, follow these directions while you're commercial fishing. So paying the fishermen to do this is an important part of, the, of what we're trying to do here. Um, and the information we wanted to collect, it's basically the effort, you know, where they're fishing, how much they're fishing there, and then trying to get that typical suite of the sex of the animals, the size of the animals. It's information that's very basic, but was lacking from these offshore areas. So, the last three bullets are really in one. It's the activity, the communication support. That's the ongoing research, the ongoing activity. So when they started about 10 years ago, there were 12 vessels involved in the program. That two year period or two and a half year period, they took about 75,000 samples of lobsters and crab. And the process is, is just shown here. We get out to the docks, we train the fishermen, we give them the tools. Um, that guy in the top there is John Grant, the Linda and Laura out of Block Island. So he's, him and other fishermen like him are collecting data. They use that app right there to send us the data they collect. When they go to shore, it goes into our database. We feed them back the information that they've collected. So they get reports from us about the animals they're measuring. But then we're also sending that data to the state and federal government to be incorporated in the management of lobsters and crabs. And that's the process that's been going on for 10 years now. Um, and it's been a really big success for our foundation, it's one of our flagship programs. So every, hopefully you can see that all those hatched areas is all the places where data from the research fleet has come from. Uh, we have 33 vessels that have participated and they've collected tons and tons of information on lobsters and crabs. Um, we've expanded the type of information. So now it's not just that basic biological data. Now they're actually getting pictures to try and stage the eggs of the lobsters. They're trying to give us information about their molt stage. So they're getting more evolving, more advanced information. Um, and we're getting it used in the stock assessment, most importantly. So the data that's being collected is used and directed in helping the fishery be sustainable. So this quote right here is basically, there's 3 million pounds of lobsters that the scientists wouldn't have data about uh, if it wasn't for this program. And that helps them judge you know, how much can be caught. So it's important in the process of collecting data and it helps them feel like the data is being collected correctly. Uh, it's also been, about 10 years now. So we're seeing all sorts of extension projects that can be done with this data. Some coming from the top or scientists and managers and some coming from the bottom. So an example of something that came from the scientists was they needed updated size at maturity. So at what size are lobsters becoming sexually mature? The data they had was about 20 years old. Um, so we worked with participants from the research fleet, those red areas, to bring in lobsters uh, in the lab, they got worked up and analyzed for maturity. And what we saw is that on Georgia's bank, 
got furthest from me. They're actually getting sexually mature at smaller sizes than 20 years ago. So that information it impacts the assessment. So this is one example of you know, a request from the manager that we're able to fill with the research fleet. And then from the bottom up, so questions that come from the fishermen, we can also address. So one fisherman that works in Narragansett Bay, he says, hey, I'm seeing way more shell disease on small lobsters than I ever saw before. So we can look at your data. We can look at the data from the guys fishing next to you that are participating to help answer that question. So we've done that for that 10 years, they're collecting disease information and we can dig into that for them. And what we see here on this chart, you know, basically vertically, the higher that is, the more disease prevalence or the category prevalence. The blue is no disease, the red is a lot of disease and the data matches his observations um, in terms of overall, you know, shell disease over 10 years has increased. That red line is more severe cases and less lobster with no shell disease. Uh, and I'm not showing you here, but there is a size trend as well, where there's smaller lobsters that can usually escape disease because they're molting more, can't really do that as effectively. So a huge amount of data from this, from the fishermen on the water. Um, there's other stuff that we're looking into that I'm not gonna share. I put it up here if you have questions about any of this. Um, we can talk about it after. And then similarly, you know, I'm going to skip that there's more research, leaks, as we call it, going on for different species, black sea bass, welts, and scallops, and then also just collecting basic oceanographic data. We call it the shelf fleet. Uh, it's fishermen doing uh, conductivity, temperature, and depth tasks while they're out fishing. So a lot more about fishermen uh, filling gaps. So we go out <clears throat> with fishermen. That was examples of fishermen doing it on their own with our instruction. But then we also go out on their vessels and sample as well. So we, we're using fishing vessels as research platforms, but we're doing activities outside of commercial fishing to help monitor impacts. Uh, and in this case, why well, I talked about this because Block Island is, is world renowned for the first wind farm in Rhode Island, or in the nation, I should say, but not for long. Uh, well, we'll always be the first, but it won't be the only one for long. And we even tried to engage the developer of this site here, uh, it's South Fork Wind, the developer is Orsted, and you know they need people to do fisheries monitoring for them. So what is there now? What's gonna be there after they build these wind farms uh, in terms of commercially important species? It's something that they need to assess during their development. So to get their permits, they need to have somebody out there monitoring this. So we approach them to have fishermen collect this data, to have fishing vessels go out there with our scientists on there, have the guys that are fishing these grounds that know these areas, be a part of this research, help direct it. Um, we were able to do that for a suite of surveys here. There's been lots of challenges and I'll just give you all the kind of 10,000 foot view of what we're doing and some of the challenges that we've encountered. So we have four different, um, one is a beam trawl survey. I'll show you a picture of that, but really what we're after are those small animals that live close to the bottom of the ocean and then also scallops. Uh, we're working with the University of Rhode Island. We're doing toes in the wind farm area, that green, that cool kind of green. Um, but the hashed area and then closest to me is a control area. So you do this survey, uh, it's going to be a six year survey before they start development and after and you compare to see if there's a difference detected. Um, a beam trawl is shown there. That's kind of the typical catch in the really commercially important species that's after is scallops here. Um, a little bit different design is our survey for lobsters and crabs. So it's the same approach where you're surveying an area inside the development, but now we're looking at two areas outside of the development. It helps you get a better study. Um, but the point is, is that this is focused on lobsters and crabs using lobsters and crab fishermen uh, as the research platform for research partners. The most controversial study for us has been this uh, gillnet survey. So a gillnet 
is basically a, a net that's transparent and floats in the water. Fish swim by it, they get caught in it. It's really an important way to survey or to fish for skates and monkfish, which are shown here. And because of the way that South Fork is, has um, lots of rocks in it, you can't do traditional survey methods like a big trawl. So the gill net was the only way to really survey these two commercially important species. But with the gill net, you interact with protected species a lot more than other survey types. So a short version of this is we did it for two years. We caught too many seals for Orsted's liking. Um, it was still permitted, it was still legal to do this, but they had the right to stop this survey. Um, and that's what happened. So we're no longer doing this survey. So there's a data gap right there for um, two species of fish that are commercially important. And then to end on a, a bit brighter note, um, in a very different study, is trying to get at this reef effect. So when they build wind turbines, one of the expected outcomes is they put all this substrate and rocks at the base, as you all might know from Block Island, where there's tons of reef effects seen there with black sea bass and other animals inhabiting it. So this is trying to get a scientific measurement of that. So we're putting traps at the base of the turbine and then for a distance away from the turbine. And the idea is, do you see these structure-loving fish in high abundance closer to the turbine than about a kilometer away from the turbine? So that's all in the wind farm area. It's not comparing areas. It's trying to get at a specific effect. And the focus really is black sea bass and stuff for that. So we're doing a lot of different surveys for the wind farm company. Um, and that's really uh, the most of our fishery independent monitoring comes from that partnership or, or working with them. So to move on a bit, uh, but still kind of stay in something relevant to wind farms is our next goal here, which is to create opportunities for fishermen. So that really comes, there's three different ways that I think we're doing that right now. Um, gear engineering is trying to reduce bycatch or improve catch efficiency by using different gear or by changing the gear that you're already using. And then increased species utilization can be linked to that if you're using something that allows you access to different areas. And I've, I've grouped them together uh, for a specific project example, and that is automatic squid jigging. So something that's done worldwide, the number one way that squid are harvested is through jigging. So these are hooks that are put in the water by machines. The machines are bringing the hooks up in regular time intervals. And there is massive ships that you see here, and then there's small coastal ships that are on the bottom there. So those big ships, they have hundreds of these machines on them. So if we look globally, that's how squid are caught. If we look regionally in the United States, it's not how squid are caught. Squid are caught with trawls, so dragging a net behind the boat. There were some efforts 25 years ago to try and do jigging with these machines in the United States and for various reasons. They failed, but we still have a strong recreational fishing for using jigs. So there's gotta be something missing here, right? How can everybody worldwide be so successful with jigging, but here we can only do it through recreation. How can we scale up that catch? I'm not convinced it's because of the species. I think it's just because of, of time and effort and dedication. So as a foundation, we think now is the time for that effort and dedication for a few different reasons. Um, the bycatch, incidental catch of animals other than squid is an issue in the fishery. It keeps coming up about one in every three animals caught in a squid trawl is not a squid. So here's an example of, of that mixed catch where you could have very clean with squid jigging. Um, you don't catch anything besides squid basically doing that. There's increased capacity for harvest. So we only get about on average, 30% of the squid quota that's available um, every time there's a quota. So how do we increase that? Trawling doesn't happen at night. They only trawl during the day. They lay up at night. They don't fish. You could squid jig at night. The machines are automatic. It only takes one or two people to operate them. Um, and they're supposed to be brought in at a higher, better condition. So can we get extra value for these squid? Maybe we won't catch as much 
but maybe they're a better quality that can fetch a higher price. So another reason, and then really why the timing is now is, is challenges for access. So we have a network of closures. This is off of Massachusetts. But the point is all those colored areas are open and closed at different times because they don't want trawling in there for various reasons. So, and that extends offshore on Georgia's bank as well. So if you're trawling, you've got to deal with this network of closures and soon you're going to be, have to deal with wind farms. So these wind farms, lease areas that are all being developed off Southern New England here, you could just put the squid trawl fishery footprint and it would overlap with that highly. And there's strong concerns and it's probably very like you're going to be able to trawl within these larger wind turbine fields. So if you can't trawl in your wind farm field, how do you continue access to that? Maybe squid jigging is the answer. So that's what we've done. Um, we started a couple of years ago. We got funding for a pilot project. We've had about, about 20 days at sea using um, these jiggy machines that you see here at the top. And we kind of came in that as a, um, Maybe I don't want to say arrogant, but it kind of we thought the machines would have a baseline catch and that we would work with the fishermen to tweak that up. But that's not what happened. It was like the first day was the best and we caught about 100 pounds of squid. And then after that, we had very limited success. But what it did do was really catalyze interest within the commercial fishing industry about using this as maybe an additional tool to a guy that fishes for a lot of different things. Maybe he can stick one of these machines on his vessel, increase his squid harvest or have squid harvest. Um, so that momentum that we created is being pursued in two different ways. First is this lending program that we just got funding for. So we had a major funding for a couple of years to do this pilot work. After that, those jigging machines just go in the basement. Well, it doesn't have to be that way. We have fishermen that are interested in trying this out on their own. So this lending program gives us the ability to get these um, equipment out to this fisherman to help them set it up on their vessels, kind of like that on deck data, give them a set of metrics to calculate and to quantify so that we can kind of have a standardized way that they're collecting data. So it's not just like hearsay or anecdote, it's, it's somewhat regulated um, or regular rather. So that's what we're gonna hope to do um, with those machines. And then the really big step forward is that, you know, another interest came from the Japanese through different avenues. And basically there's a company that wants to expand to the United States. So they're called Hamade. They're the biggest squid jig producer in the world. And now because they want to come into a new market and we want to use their machines, we have a partnership with them where they'll be sending over four machines and a master uh, we'll be funding some of the vessel side, the equipment side, and we'll be working with them um, to do trials on one of, Town Dock is the biggest uh, squid company in Rhode Island, probably in the uh, United States. So we're working with Town Dock vessels, a master from Japan, and their equipment to try and get this off, off the ground. So that'll be going on as a three-year project. So we're, we're not giving up on squid jigging. Uh, we see that as a way to improve harvest and, you know, deal with this activity of decreased access. Another example of how we're trying to create opportunities, it was kind of these one of these weird projects. I didn't know where to put it at first, but I think it, it is an opportunity. It's a way to turn a problem into a job, into a way that fishermen are contributing to cleaning up the environment. And that's with dealing with lost and abandoned fishing gear, which some of you are probably familiar with. Actually, I saw it when I was taking the ferry here. There was like a boat loaded with tons of traps that can't possibly be used anymore. Um, so we call it ghost gear, but basically this is gear that has been lost at sea for various reasons, um, sometimes intentional, most of the time not intentional. Uh, the problems, the reason my board want us to get involved with it is that there's a feeling that it continues to kill. So this is some examples from underwater work done by the Master's Division of Marine Fisheries. On the bottom, the lobster trap are supposed to have these panels that rust out. That's what that bottom picture is showing. The panel would drop off and that would allow animals to escape if the trap is lost. But it doesn't always happen. In this case, all this growth is preventing that thing from falling off. 
and then the top, you can see it's still filled with animals. It's continuing to catch. And then things like gill nets on the far side for me, those definitely continue to catch. They're, they're basically plastic that never goes away. Um, it's also a hazard for fishermen. Sometimes they can't fish areas because there's so much lost gear there. There are areas that become dumping grounds for trawlers that run into this gear. They're not allowed legally to bring it back. There's regulation that you only have on your vessel gear that's yours. So they dump it in certain areas, making these piles, and then people can't set gear there. And then if you haul up something like this, this is a hazard. Um, it takes time to cut it out of the net. It can injure you. So you know, they want it gone from their fishing areas. And the last thing I've been telling people is that this is plastic trash. There's all this effort about marine debris, moving marine plastic. We don't use wooden lobster traps anymore. We have everything is metal coated in plastic for traps, basically. And then things like gill nets, all the ropes these guys are using, they're not natural fibers, they're synthetic fibers, it's plastic. So anything that is a plastic problem could also be um, a ghost gear issue or lost fishing gear issue. So what are we doing with this um, issue? So first we wanted to raise awareness and show people that this is actually a problem. And we decided to do that through, through mapping and visualization. So we interviewed eight fishermen. We focused on Narragansett Bay, which is an important bay. I'm sure you all know Narragansett Bay, we'll go into that. Um, and what you have here is from those interviews, you have locations where on a nautical chart, they over one-on-one -on -one interviews had mapped for us where they had encountered ghost gear. And then we took those inter independent interviews, overlaid them to make a map. And the black is where multiple people were saying they've encountered ghost gear. And it doesn't mean the gray um, doesn't have ghost gear, but you know, for example, there's only one fisherman we worked with that fishes up top there. So black areas gave us a point of focus. We did some camera work. We went down and we dropped the camera to confirm there was ghost gear down there. We did some side scan sonar work. So all those little squares are actually lobster traps. So basically we made it undeniable that this is a problem, that this is here um, and we need to think about it. And we're able to leverage that for some funding to create a ghost gear removal plan for Rhode Island which is you know, state waters here in the gray, including Block Island. We developed that plan. And now, uh, thanks to 11th Hour Racing, we are enacting that plan. So this winter in Narragansett Bay, we did about four or five target removal trips using local fishermen um, as those vessels. They, they know how to deal with ghost gear. They deal with it all the time. Now they have a scientist on board. You know, they grapple with it, they bring it on. We um, take the metrics of, of what's in the traps. We work with the state of Rhode Island. So they bring those traps to, that's the Newport docks right there. And they use that um, tractor to smash them all down for us. So it's, it was a lot of work. Um, these are some of the, the smash down traps. This is Susan and Tori who are working on this project. And you know what they had to do is before all the traps smashed down, cut all the ropes off of it and cut all the nets out of there. So they call that the, um, the heads of the trap where they put the bait in the fish in the lobster. So we were trying to recycle this metal. So we need to remove anything that wasn't metal from the traps. So in a period of about a month, we got 4,000 pounds of traps out of Narragansett Bay and about five barrels of rope. Um, and it was really just a proof of concept. We wanted to show people we can do this safely. It wasn't about filling up the back deck of the lobster boat. It was about going through the process safely, working with the state, showing we can be good partners, finding a way to recycle this. So the metal went to a scrap yard, the rope went to some uh, organization called Net Your Problem, who has a facility in New Bedford where they try and recycle all this rope. Um, and that's, that's what we've done. That's what we're gonna keep doing for another couple of years. Um, last science, not a second to last science translation probably just call it science communication. Uh, but, you know, really a lot of science stuff, it's, it's very specific to scientists. It's hard to communicate and attach it to the real meaning to the fishing community. So we have a couple projects that are meant to kind of translate that so people can understand. So 
So the example I'm gonna give is this thing called Fluidity Intrusions. So Hui, our partners, they make this diagram of all the stuff that's going on on the ocean and for the oceanographic processes. You know, I only know what three quarters of those terms mean. And we're only really focused on this one particular process. And what uh, intrusion is, it's an influx of warm, salty water. So we're trying to communicate that through workshops, uh, when they're going on the research vessels, beyond the vessels, um, tweeting and blogging about this information and trying to connect it to the fishing community. So, hey, this is where we're seeing these intrusions. What weird stuff are you guys seeing in this location? And we get reports of jellyfish, tuna that aren't supposed to be there at that time, um, octopus. So we're trying to not only have workshops to communicate the science, but connect it to the fish. So if you have an intrusion, what does that mean for your fishing? Uh, one thing that's come out is it's definitely seems to be linked with squid. So squid are seeming to ride these intrusions in. And now we're trying to work with a commercial fishing vessel. We did one trip where the research vessel or our shelf fleet identify where the intrusion is happening. And we have a trawler go through and see you know, what they get in that intrusion. So we're trying to build that connection to reality from kind of the desk work and academics. And then lastly, education. So I mentioned in the beginning how we wanna work with students and show them this process from the very beginning. So I won't get into to everything, but basically, you know, many of our projects have um, internships or student engagement with it. These are the students that are directly funded by us right now. There, there's a lot of other ones that are funded uh, in the past. And I, in making this slide, I realized it's not intentional that they're all University of Rhode Island students this summer. Um, so it's not, not just supposed to be that way, but it does show the importance of us being on the campus and a part of the URI community where a lot of these students are applying and we're kind of have this relationship with the university where we're giving students experience that they can't necessarily get uh, through their academic pursuits um, with their professors. So with that, we have other active projects. I can just you know wait a minute here. And if you wanna ask me questions about uh, these projects, I'm happy to, to talk about them. The electronic gear marking is, is related to ropeless gear. There's more wind farm surveys. Uh, we're trying to work with spider crab to create a market there. So there's a lot of more activity going on, but I just tried to give you know, one example uh, for each of those bullet points I provided. Uh, this wouldn't be possible without a lot of different funding sources um, and a lot of different people that, that help us with this foundation. So with that, happy to have questions and discussion. So there was a question about the spider crab project and increasing utilization. So, so what we're doing with that project, there's, there's two phases. First, it's a, a pre-assessment it's called. So we're trying to figure out what data is available about the abundance of spider crab. So we're doing a literature search and we're doing uh, fishermen interviews because we don't want to create a market for something that is seemingly abundant, but once you start commercially fishing, it's, it's not. Um, and the other part of that is trying to create food products from this. Um, so there's a scientist at URI who we're working with. He thinks he can, from some preliminary trials, uh, develop like a food taste additive. So think about it as like um, that fake crab when they're adding flavor, crab flavor to pollock or other products. Spider crab could be a way to do that. And then we're working with a processor, Atlantic red crab to see if they can actually pick meat out of these crabs and have a pick product that's economically viable for them. So that's, those are the prongs of that project. And I should say that the impetus is that basically spider crabs are a pest. These guys are targeting lobsters and Jonah crab. And at times they're filling their pots with these spider crabs. So can we change that pest to a profit for them? Yes. Yeah. So. I think the, the question is, are we also concerned about the like environmental benefits of the squid jig, not just the commercial um, side of it? So yeah, I think that is a part of the motivation too. So most of that bycatch is, is, is thrown back, um, probably doesn't live. You know, one example is that they have, they catch butterfish and the butterfish catch limit. So if they catch too much butterfish before they catch their squid, the squid fishery shuts down. 
So there is an incentive um, to reduce that bycatch from a commercial perspective, but also from a biological perspective to kind of you know, have these other animals not have those concerns because they are commercially viable like butterfish. Um, you know, trawling and squid mops. So squid lay their eggs on the bottom of the ocean and then you want to fish for the squid that are laying the eggs. So when you trawl over that, you could be impacting that next generation of squid, which is really important because these animals only live a year. So you're basically wiping out the population. So getting away from that, you know, in like a fishery sustainability standpoint, is a motivation, but we don't want to replace trawling. Maybe if you increase capacity, you could increase your jigging, which doesn't have any of those concerns. And there's, there's basically no bycatch. So we did like 20 um, days at sea and we caught two like swimming crabs. Uh, that's the only bycatch. And just from the literature, there really isn't any encompassized or squid. I do say that, but really the, the, the one that's getting people interested in this is, is a way to increase revenue to catch more squid, um, not so much, you know, selling them on the environmental benefits of jigging. And the, the other big thing is, is the access. They're really concerned about not being able to fish anymore. Once it's up. Yes. A question about how a jigging machine works. So basically you have the machine here and then those red things are a little hooks, a little jigs. So you set the machine, um, it'll, it'll let out the line until a set amount, and then it'll start bringing it back in. So basically a conveyor belt of hooks that you drop down into the water where you have squid a mass. Uh, a key is attracting them to the light. So we have lots of lights, you bring a ball of squid, the machine drops them down, and then ideally you have like fish baskets under here and they just kind of fall off the jig when they come down the chutes. So it's, it's very similar to what you would do recreationally, but it's just like on a scale that's higher. You gotta, that's a huge part of it. And that's one of the reasons that people are um, skeptical if this will work, because apparently the squid that we fish for are the least light sensitive squid around. So other squid are easy to aggregate with light. Maybe these aren't so easy. But the Japanese are determined to help us. So it'll work. <laughs> I, I can't speak specifically recreationally. I, I think as a whole, it still applies. So the, the question is, um, can we talk about black sea bass management and what to expect in the future? OK. Um, so yeah, the Mid-Atlantic Council dictates the amount of quota that black sea bass that we're allowed to get. Um, and there's like politics and science involved here. So black sea bass are increasing in abundance. That's not questioned. And they're also shifting north. And we don't think it's just a migration. We think it's, it's an increase in the population. So there's an assessment right now, it's like the lobster stuff I was talking about, that I think will say that there is, there's more black sea bass out there than before. So that should increase the quota for everybody across the board. Then the politics get into it is that, so it's the Mid-Atlantic Council. So there's representation from North Carolina, I believe, all the way until um, New Jersey on that council for voting members. And there's, there's other stuff uh, part of it too, but the Southern states don't wanna give up their quota for the Northern states to have more. So basically it's like everybody gets a piece of the pie, Virginia gets 10%, North Carolina gets 20%, and so forth. And to give Rhode Island, you know, 25%, well, Virginia's got to give up their 5%. They don't want to do that. So that's part of it. Um, and an issue is that the quotas are, are pretty low considering what the catch rates can be. So that Black Sea Bass Research Fleet is trying to give fishermen the ability to, to document that in a scientific way. Um, so for about 10, seven years now, um, it's, it's part of the assessment right now. It's basically 60% of all the fish that these guys are throwing back are legal sized fish. And they're throwing them back because they've cut their quota. So sometimes in Rhode Island, the commercial quota is as low as 50 pounds in a trip. And they can get more than that in one tow or one haul of a gillnet um, or one fish pot trawl. 
and they have to throw them back. So that was the purpose of that project is to scientifically document that. Now, that graph is size. And, yes, sir. And that's kind of the, um, sorry. So the, we can't see black sea bass five years ago and now they're everywhere. And that's the exact problem. It's like fishermen are on the water. You see this, they see this, but management and science is slow to react. Um, I don't know much. We don't do much with striped bass or anything with striped bass. I, I think I heard that it was going down. There were reduction in the quota. They decreased the slot size. Yeah. So that's got to be hard. Right? How do you do that? Yes. So what's causing the increase in the population of black sea bass? We think it's climate change. So basically the water here is warmer, longer than it was in the past. So you have black sea bass, which used to be seasonal visitors, are now year-round residents. Uh, the water doesn't get cold enough to kill them off in some places, or it doesn't get cold enough quick enough to, to move offshore and then come back in instead of dying. Um, so we're actually starting another project in Narragansett Bay because fishermen have been seeing like little tiny black sea bass that big that couldn't possibly have traveled there. They're too small. So they're, this is as overwintering. They're born in the fall and they survive the winter. And they're now, that's the proof of saying that, hey, they're year round residents here. They're not, they're not coming and going anymore. Yes. Oh, sorry. Are we interested? Oh, we'd be interested in data about small black sea bass here from Block Island. We would be uh, for sure. Uh, I think we have some guys that are around Block Island, but the thing is we have to give them um, ventless fish traps. So normally we issue commercial traps. Now you want to give them scientific gear. Um, so, but if you're collecting them, we would definitely be interested. Yeah, so if you did that, the key would be during the winter um, or when they're not supposed to be around. You know, because the whole thing is, oh, they're moving in, but they're not moving in if they're this big and it's January, they, they live there. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is, how do we keep up with the rate of change in, in science? And it's really hard. The only um, answer I have is like trying to be uh, adaptable and fishing for many species now instead of just one. So you're seeing a lot of guys diversify um, so they can switch. It doesn't really help address you know, the science part of it or dealing with the rate of change, changing, but it, it's like flexibility is so important now. Uh, so I, the same thing could be for management. There are examples of like adaptive management and management that, that can be implemented quickly and not take six months and several years to act on, but that's really not done here. Yes. We have, uh, you can go to our website and we have publications listed there. You can download them. Um, and then all of the data from these research fleets goes to like the federal warehouse where you know, the scientists can access them. I don't know about the general public, but it's published for the federal and state scientists. And then, sorry, are we seeing our publications cited? We are definitely seeing the, the publications and data used in the stock assessments. And then where we're seeing the most um, publications being used is this, is this oceanographic stuff. So, you know, this is like basic baseline data. So this is, um, this is not us publishing, this is other scientists, there's five journal publications where they've taken our data and published scientific journals about it. Uh, marine heat waves and warm core ring increases. So that's really the, the big one. This one just came out. Yeah, increasing the salinity max. Uh, so yeah, we are. That's important for me is to publish. And that's how we gain credibility. Go to our website and sign up for our portal. It's, uh, yeah, so we actually just changed it. So now it's every other month. We have a shorter newsletter. So we kind of did some research and the, the new trend is more, less. I mean, more frequently, less content. So that's what we've done. So you can go to our website, you can sign up. Um, it should be a pretty brief newsletter coming in your inbox only uh, twice a month, twice every other month. Yeah, not twice a month. Uh, it's CF, 
ourfoundation.org. All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate the questions. Thanks, Dave. And you could tell from all the slides up there that there was a heck of a lot of additional stuff that, he, you know, you didn't go through, but you, all the studies you're working on. And I subscribe to the newsletter. It's a really cool thing to get and yeah. learn about these things that you guys are doing. So thank you very much for coming. And if there's any way we can help, let well, us know. The, the black sea bass stuff. And then, um, yeah, we'll think of ways to keep working together. Great, great. And next week, so, so the comments were, Oh, yeah. you know Not trying to get the anymore. charter fishermen involved <laughs> yeah i think we have to do that i i also should say we're we're starting a project um next year with mechanical digging for fish so it's like a squid but it's for fish and we're going to be targeting working with charter fishermen for that but right. recreational is like outside our scope it's a whole thing that i'm not going to get involved with recreational versus commercial guys <laughs> okay thanks dave and <laughs> And next week, we'll have John Dodd here from the Atlantic Shark Institute to tell us about how many great whites you can find around our shores. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. Oh,